I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over, and Jesse Burton is back. We're very excited. She's done, at this point, I think six novels for adults and two novels for middle grade and YA, and I hope I have those numbers right, but we're going to come back to that in a second. The Miniaturist pubbed in the UK and the US in 2014. It was the subject of a very hot auction. It did very, very well. It sold a million copies in its first year. It was a Discover Great New Writers pick for Barnes & Noble, and it was also a Waterstones Book of the Year. <laughs> Our sibling company. Jesse, it's so great to see you because you have written a sequel to The Miniaturist, which I don't think anyone knew you were really working on. So where did this come from? What's going on? Hi, it's great to see you. <laughs> Hello, it's so nice to see you again, eight years on. Where did it come from? Well, I think when I finished The Miniaturist, when I mm -hmm. sort of put the final full stop and I, I, you know, sent it off, I thought that was it. It was just this hermetically right. sealed story. Um, but I suppose looking back now, I can see uh, I really did leave the door open, literally, mm -hmm. figuratively speaking. Mm -hmm. And um, as the years have passed, I think I've, I've come to accept that that universe of the Herengrup Canal, Amsterdam, Golden Age, but particularly the person of Nella mm -hmm. Brandt and her family occupy a very different place in mm -hmm. my writer's imagination, in my, in my soul, in my mind. Um, but there were other things I wanted to write and, and I didn't want to just be the Dutch doll's house woman. And I think like as early as 2016, so two years after it published, I, mm -hmm. I was already writing a few scenes, but then I realized I was just pushing it too quickly. And perhaps right. those were just hangover scenes, some kind of exorcism that needed to be done. Um, and, you know, I, I did do a lot of stuff for the miniaturist talking about it for a long time. And I, and I think I felt I needed some time away from Nella yep. and that I was done with her. But then I realized I don't think Nella was done with me and <laughs> I had to sort of just accept it and just like open the floodgates and bring her back. And I think it was, it was around 2017, 18, I mentioned to my agent, I think mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to write another one and it's going to be a few years on. Um, and then that's where I sort of started sort of working out where am I going to meet these people again? Mm -hmm. And that's how that's how I began it. I just sort of thought, where are they at, and and how how can I put them back in a plot in a context? Because I know them well as people, but mm -hmm. you know m these books are the kind of books where things happen. So I had to work out what was going to happen. And Thea, the first time we meet her in the miniaturist, obviously she's a brand new baby, and now she's Thea a little, is she's eighteen. She's a little newborn, right? Yeah, yeah. She's eighteen, and I do want to stress that a House of Fortune can be read as a standalone. You don't have to have read the miniaturist. No. However, there's some fun stuff if you have. I mean, I, I had a good time figuring good. out what was going on with tiny Thea, now 18-year-old Thea. But at the same time, really, this book is, it's 18 years later, and Nella mm -hmm. is a different person. Let's just be clear. You don't have to have read The Miniaturist in order to enjoy what's happening in no. House of Fortune. There are a couple of subplots that we're going to stay away from because we want to be really, really super spoily free in this conversation, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's really fun to see what you put your characters through. But let's let's start with Nella and her niece, Thea, because I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. there's an 18 year difference between them, but Journey's not all that different. No, no. And I think it, it's very interesting to me to have written a new 18 year old who mm -hmm is in many ways very different to her aunt, has yep. had an incredibly different experience. She was born mm -hmm. in Amsterdam. She has a black father mm -hmm. um, and a white mother deceased. So mm -hmm. her experience of literally, you know, living uh, on the streets of Amsterdam is very different to her aunt. But she has that similar rebelliousness and stubborn will <laughs> that Nella exhibited when she was 18. But Nella has sort of undergone this slight amnesia, I think. She can't mm -hmm. quite remember herself ever like this. Equally, Thea cannot imagine that any of them in her family know what it's like to be 18 years old. So there's right. immediately, I set up, I suppose, this antagonism between the two mm -hmm. of them of, you know, gross misunderstanding of where the other one is coming from, but also a quite uh, painful love. I mean, Nella, a lot mm. of what Nella does in this book is an attempt to protect her niece. But also, I think Nella doesn't realize what she's doing. She's exorcising her own demons upon her unwilling niece, Thea, really imposing a future upon her that Nella had imposed upon her when mm -hmm. she was 18. So there is echoing and mirroring 
between you know Nella 18 and Thea 18 but also they are very different people um and particularly with their responses to the miniaturist as, mm-hmm. as a character and as a force in the book it was very in, I want enjoyable I don't know is the word but to right. kind of bring Nella on uh in her life 37 years old both advanced through her years but also in some strange way stuck somewhere in the past not just in her 18 year old pivotal year Mm -hmm. but also as a little girl back in the countryside and working out a path backwards. I remember saying to myself, this is a book that has to keep moving forwards, but it's looking backwards at the same time. So it Mm -hmm. has this strange uh, duality of motion, I guess. I seem to have this thing in all my novels. I have these Mm -hmm. like vivacious 18, 16, 20 year old girls, and then an older woman Mm -hmm. kind of uh, going through her own thing, but also like in dialogue with her. But that's part of the fun of reading House of Fortune 2 is I had a couple of moments where I was yelling at Nella. And yes, I'm talking about yelling at fictional characters. I will own it. <laughs> I, I will totally time. own it. I like <laughs> judge away. Fine. Um, and a couple of moments where I was yelling at Thea and mm. well, one, you did your job. <laughs> so novelist, Cause I was in there hard, but at the same time, you know, you do have to let things play out. My understanding is the draft, the the book that's out in the world is actually the third draft yeah of what you started writing and nella didn't actually appear until very late in the process yeah nella was going to be a character but we weren't going to be in her head it wasn't going to be the interiority of Mm -hmm. nella it was going to be all through the eyes of thea and possibly otto Mm -hmm. and possibly cornelia the maid um and my agent did say oh i do miss her i didn't write nella back in just to satisfy my literary agent but I think I realized what I was doing a bit and that was perhaps keeping her at arm's length because I feel very oddly aligned to Nella as a character, right. as a person myself. And um, having ha- having created this character 13 years ago now, 2009, I first started writing her, who really did transform my own fortunes, my own life, for good and bad at the time. I had such a complicated relationship with her. So like bringing her back in, it was a bit like meeting a friend. You say you scream at fictional characters. Well, I, I, I you know, I wonder whether I'm going to like meeting them again in my own mind. Um, and, you know, whether we were <laughs> going to get on and, you know, that frosty, right, if right. friends have like been apart for a while and there might have mm-hmm. been a bit of a bumpy moment and then you realize you still love each other. Um, it was a bit like that. And as soon as I started Nella's voice, it was, yeah, it was mm. odd. It was just like slipping straight back into that stream of her. Um, but, you know, and also the ghost, I suppose the ghost of Marin is there, that the, the Thea's mm-hmm. mother and, and the, the antagonist in Nella's life. Right. All her preoccupations, Nella seems to have embodied, but because Nella's so concerned about appearances and maintaining, surviving in this society, this golden society where appearances are everything. They're also broke. They're really broke. <laughs> they're super broke. They have sold off the rugs. They have. Yeah. They are down to the last painting. And yes, they are. the last painting goes too. Yeah. I mean, they are broke. And yeah. Nella is doing that thing that her first thought is, how do I help my kid? Because she thinks of Thea as her daughter. She really yeah, does. She does. How do I help my kid survive? And that yeah. means marriage. Because yeah, that's where I- we are. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, compromise, compromise mm. of, of uh, morals or of, of heart. I sort of pictured the house that, that where they live mm-hmm. in. It's like a stage set and almost like the flats yeah. are falling, opening, exposing them and all the props are being removed. And the clothes are, bit, you know, that mm-hmm. their clothes are sort of thinning out. And um, her, she's being... It's funny, actually, because speaking to readers, some people are very... Um, supportive of of Nella and understand and sympathize and other people are quite they're quite angry with me they're like Nella's they were expecting Nella to to like Nella to be a positive uh person from the off and I'm like come on like this is no spoiler Mm -hmm. and as you say it can be a standalone novel I'm very I've made it very I've done it very carefully so that Mm -hmm. a reader could enjoy this as its own book but you know Nella was married off at 18 and her life has been sort of preserved in aspects since then and she's angry. There's mm-hmm. rage there. And it's kind of manifesting itself in quite sort of obstructive and confrontational behavior with people mm-hmm. that care about her the most and that she cares about the most. So she's just doggedly going for these suitors, one in particular, Jacob, um, 
because she really thinks he will be the embodiment of uh, future success and safety mm -hmm. and security. Money is everything in this society. And Jacob represents money and safety in, in Nella's eyes. But she's definitely, as I said earlier, she's sort of slightly living vicariously and not seeing her niece for who she really is. Um, and Thea has her own uh, intentions, as, as you alluded to earlier. She does. She does. Thea's dad, Otto, mm. who worked with the family, the Brandt family previously, and he was previously enslaved in yeah. Suriname and obviously does not talk about that experience. And Marin, Thea's mother, was his lover, and she dies in childbirth, obviously. And yeah. so they, their relationship was never front and center because it couldn't be no. but he's also saying hey wait a minute slow down no <laughs> this is not what my kid wants yeah <laughs> he, he he's very he's very wary about this man jacob and just very wary about that society in general and what it not just represents in a sort of theoretical way but in an actual lived experience what it will be like for thea and what his Jacob's intentions actually are. And Otto has to occupy this really strange limbo where he is, to all intents and purposes, an Amsterdammer. He was brought mm -hmm. from Suriname when he was 16 um, and has all the, the manners and the skills that you know an Amsterdam merchant has. But he sort of feels like the house itself that they're living in, that the end of the road is here and we have mm -hmm. to take a new direction and what's that going to be and that's why I, I noticed with the american version there's just a gigantic pineapple <laughs> we are going to talk because i have a question yeah, about pineapple that's the direction <laughs> the, the neon pineapple i didn't realize and sure we're talking about greenhouses obviously but i didn't think you could grow pineapple or mango or kiwi or whatnot in amsterdam like in the netherlands well, i just neither did i me where until <laughs> i started, started right, looking so into it <laughs> we need to talk about research for a second because yeah you know i figured family fortunes would be reversed i mean this is part of the fun of reading something like this right but yeah at the same time i was like pineapple yeah i know okay. how did well, you get there <laughs> Well, I can't quite remember exactly, but I do. I, one of the things I wanted to do that I knew would never enter the actual pages of the novel were was look into Otto's experience in Suriname and what, what mm -hmm. that would have been like for him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I knew, and right. even though it wasn't written in the book. And obviously one of the main fruits that were grown there were pineapples. Mm -hmm. And there was a woman who was sent by the Dutch East India Company um, Maria Sibylla Merriam, who's mm -hmm. quite well known. She painted these gorgeous paintings on behalf of the VOC in Suriname of the flora and fauna. 53 years old, she sailed there on her own with her daughter mm -hmm. and just set up and painted them all. And the pineapple is just a particularly evocative fruit and it's very mm -hmm. symbolic of um, luxury and rarity, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, back in Europe. And it became this kind of status symbol for wealthy Dutch. Uh, men and women who would employ uh, botanists and engineers in, on their estates to build hot houses and stove houses, they were mm -hmm. called, trying to work out ways to create, um, you know, tropical temperate temperatures. Because it was the Dutch, <laughs> there was a lot of record of it and a lot of annotation and archiving of it because they had so much money at the time to kind of like record what they were doing. So I found all these diagrams of the the stove houses and the success and failures that they went through and it became a bit of a sort of race a, mm -hmm. a status race to see who could win it to, to get the, the, mm -hmm. the best pineapples the best uh mangoes as you say and i think oranges and lemons were a bit and you can see them cropping up in paintings and something right. you know there's one painting i can't remember her name this woman with her family or her mm -hmm. family of children and a pineapple like it's like the fifth <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like the, no, no, it's really funny. It's like the fifth baby. It's like, this is my favorite child. <laughs> Took a lot more work. So anyway, I just thought that's, if I want to make commentary, which I mm -hmm. did on the effects of colonialism, of enslavement, of transatlantic mm -hmm. slavery, of the movement of bodies, of the enslavement of people and the invisible 
and visible results of such abuse. Um, mm -hmm. The Pineapple is a good place to do it in a, in a novel that is essentially a, psych a family psychodrama. It's not a book about the, the ills of society's, you know, mm -hmm. of, of slavery. But I thought it's an interesting one in everyone's reactions to it because Nella is very against the idea that, well, we can go into the pineapple business. What on earth mm -hmm. are you talking about? Whereas Otto, who sort of feels he has that entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. of his former employer, Johannes, um, and also it's very complicated for him because, of course, the, this is a fruit that has come from partly his land. I mean, he is originally from Dahomey in, in, in West Africa, but he grew up partly in Suriname. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like, is he going to take, is it his turn to sort of uh, engage in this beginnings of global capitalism for his own benefit? Um, and also I had a bit of fun with it because with the pineapple, I could create this character, this botanist, Casper Whitson, who is this mm -hmm. really, I would hope for the reader, well, I never want to dictate to them what they feel about any character, but for me, he was a very benign, potential character to sort of bring mm -hmm. goodness into this very stressful situation for this this broke family who's having d issues with their teenage daughter. And Cornelia gets off a very good joke about a pineapple too. She's, she just sticks it on a shelf in the pantry. She's like, I'm not touching that. <laughs> I, I know. don't know what to do with it. Why yeah. do we even have it? It's weird. Yeah. I don't understand. Well, you understand. should be able to hire them. You'd hire them for parties. Yeah. So she's like, look, it's not a potato. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. It's not a cod. It's not a herring. What is it? It looks, it looks painful. It's spiky. And that's the thing, though. You can't separate the family's money troubles from colonialism no. or slavery. You, and the idea yeah. that somehow they would all be floating around having Thea's coming of age and Otto's figuring out what his story is and Nella figuring out. I mean, we could argue that Nella's having a second coming of age, that she's finally hitting her stride and, and yeah. leaving her teenage self behind. It just took an extra 18 years. Yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. hitting the nail on the head. I feel like, although therapy was not invented in 1705, <laughs> what Thea is, uh, sorry, Nella is undergoing is somewhat of a self-analysis and a kind of coming to terms. I read something recently, which is such a brilliant sentence, is that life cannot be undone, but it can be re-examined. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is what Nella is coming to accept, that there were some dubious decisions made, but she herself had agency and involvement in those decisions and in their consequences and what is she going to do next you know and i and that the other part of this book is there it is greenery and and potential new seeds being sown and and, mm -hmm. and there's a, a lot of imagery of the garden and of fresh land and that's also nella i think something's got to give and it sounds like the house is going to give first because it's a very <laughs> expensive place to run i mean it yeah. really is not a simple thing. And the idea that Nella wouldn't get a little cynical, I'm, I'm just going back to something where you said people were a little picky that and annoyed that she had gotten a little bristly and yeah, I maybe mean, not like user friendly. Yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah. just thinking, well, yeah, okay. And again, you know, she's, let's take the miniature out a miniaturist out of it for a second. She's a widow with very few prospects living with people who are ostensibly her family, but outsiders don't see as her family. She's got a mm -hmm. housekeeper and Otto, a former employee who's also black, and Thea, her, who she considers her daughter, who's half black. Mm -hmm. And the world is looking at them going, what is who? How? <laughs> I yeah. mean, Amsterdam society sounds claustrophobic and a little inbred, and mm -hmm. they're in the yes. middle of it thinking, how do we make a living? And at one point, Otto loses his job. And he's been paying he for everything. I mean, yeah. And now we're sort of stuck. Yeah. And that, 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 that is exactly it. And that's sort of the first third of the, the story is that mm -hmm. that sense of desperation. And when he loses his job, that's when it really, um, it gets really serious, because there's no income coming in. And the only place there's any equity is the house is the four wall or the four mm -hmm. walls of the house on the Herengrad. Nella feels but she's she's felt an outsider for quite a long time and then there's this potential in with this character Clara Saragon who is the sort of doyenne of the social scene <laughs> she's such a bitch um but she's a powerful bitch mm. oh and also we mustn't forget Rebecca Bosman the actress who's a kind of a, a kind of good angel versus the bad angel mm -hmm. of Clara Saragon but yeah that, that they are in a very um odd place in society and um 
you know, I sometimes feel like with the archive that I, I managed to get access to of, of Amsterdam's history mm -hmm. for the first time round was very white. And then this, this time round, I felt very vindicated with including a much more diverse cast of characters mm -hmm. because um, when I went back in July 2020 to Amsterdam, the mm -hmm. archives had written the archivist, I think it was a big project from the Rijksmuseum. They'd done a lot of work in finding a much more varied society mm -hmm. to the extent that a black man called Christian Schwartz did inherit a house on the Herengrab from his employer nearly to the exact date that I had imagined mm -hmm. it. So I felt, I felt vindicated, but at the same time, I have to accept that, as you say, they're not, they're not that kind of homogenized quote unquote norm. And, and that society was quite claustrophobic. There were sort of, as I think it's either Otto says it, or maybe it's Nella that, you know, there are five or six families and they just work it out for themselves. Like they're the Vanderbilts, <laughs> the Astors or whatever. I'm trying to give it to an American audience. I could give some British names that they'd all just be the Jew. That's exactly it though. That's exactly yeah. it. That power is determined by a select yeah. few. And if you don't yeah. match their vision of people who deserve it, I mean, let's face it, we've got Calvinists running the place thinking, you know, <laughs> you have <laughs> predestinate. There's all sorts of theological conversations we can have, which <laughs> we are going to kind of skip over a little bit, because I have a question for you, though, about research. I mean, obviously, you've gone into the archives, you've done all of that, but at some point, you have to let the research go oh, and let the characters absolutely. breathe. You can't, no, no, otherwise, no, you're okay. writing a history book, and that's not what you're trying no, to do. No, 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 I, I totally agree. And that's always sort of been my main mm -hmm. mantra is that this is a novel and it's about, um, it's a portrait of a family and, you know, particular mm -hmm. three or four people. And the historical detail is essential for your own, I suppose, sense of security when you're writing it. But at mm -hmm. the same time, you'll never quite know the truth. It's always about who decided to write that history at that point that trickles down to, mm -hmm. to you sitting and reading a library book in the 21st century. Okay, so I alluded earlier to this being the third draft. So the, the version yeah. of this book that's out in the world is a third draft. Yeah. That's a lot of words and a lot of pages to throw away before you get to the thing that you're willing to share with other people. So can we talk about your process? Because I don't think this has happened with other books. I think this is the book where you were like, uh, I gotta yeah. keep yeah. figuring it out. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, this is the first time this has happened. I really hope it's the last. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I wrote a full draft uh, in 2020, uh, early 2020, mm -hmm. and realized it was it was just wrong. And there was just so much. But then I, I sometimes think with these things, it is a process of elimination and I had to go through it as painful as it was in order to finally get to the book I wanted to write. Right. Then the second draft was again, a complete start over. Um, so I jettisoned about 200, I, by that point, about 200,000 words. And then that winter of 2020, I handed to my editor a new 100,000. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I handed it over, I realized everything that was wrong with it it was almost like that moment of transaction was the moment of release and realization mm -hmm. and it would never have happened if I'd hoarded it to myself. Right. So I remember sending her this long email, about 4,000 words saying, oh, okay, look, I know what's wrong. You don't even need to respond. I mean, bless her, she did. And she read it, my horror. And of course she was kind about it. And, but yeah. And then, then that January, it was quite odd actually that, that December the 31st. So I gave it to her around like mid November mm -hmm. and that December, I, New Year's Eve, I found out I was pregnant. And uh, and then I chucked the whole book away. I think they are related, these two mm -hmm. facts. And then in the January, for 12 mm -hmm. weeks, the period of a trimester of pregnancy, I rewrote the book from start to finish and finished it. I just knew what I had to do. And I delivered it. And then the next, like the edited draft, not the kind right. of, you know, full rewrite with the next trimester. And then I handed it in two weeks before giving birth. So it was quite odd. That's never happened before either with my writing experience but yes to have thrown away a, a, around mm -hmm. a third of a million words i calculated i have to be satisfied that they are the absolute mm -hmm. best i can do with all my shortcomings and all my mm -hmm. flaws as a human and as a as a writer right. um for me to feel completely as much as one ever can when you put work out into the world for me to feel insulated against the worst worries and i feel like that with this book i feel like it is the book it was supposed to be 
But you're also balancing your characters' actions, their interiority, and the needs of the story. So it's not like you can just sit there and be like, well, so-and-so is having a cup of coffee and a snack. It's how do we get where we need to go? Yeah, that's quite technical and it's quite boring. I mean, Mm -hmm. prosaic. It's not the sort of fun, you know, Mm -hmm. interior monologues. It's very technical and... It, I always think, you know, I have a post-it note next to me, things that headlined things that have to happen. Mm-hmm, and it's mm-hmm. that sort of basic. Um, and you have to work out moments of reveal or moments of mm-hmm. withdrawal. And yeah, it's it's a very difficult um, process writing a book, she says, stating literally the most obvious thing <laughs> ever. But I think people sometimes who aren't writers don't understand how odd it is to have to, a book is read um, out of time. You know, you, you mm-hmm. are reading everything all at once. It's a bit like the moment you stare at a painting and everything's there for you. And yes, you can investigate it or listen to a mm-hmm. piece of music. The mm-hmm. act of writing it, one is stuck in the temporal world mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. minutes and hours and days and you cannot write it all at once. And that is the marathon element of it. That is the patience and the endurance and the bloody mindedness that um, that means why I think so few people who say they're going to write a novel actually mm-hmm. finish it because it, it does take a lot out of you and it takes a lot of sacrifice. Not that anyone makes us do it. I love the idea that you've got story beats on a post-it as you're working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes that doesn't happen for me until around the third or fourth draft. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the first two might be quite exploratory experiences. I, and I have in the past, I remember with the muse, I attempted, you know, I'd seen on Twitter or somewhere, you know, plans, people mm-hmm. make plans, and they know what's going to happen in each chapter. And then they've got the characters arc going through. Mm-hmm. And I remember mm-hmm. at the end, at the end of writing, the muse about a year after I found an A3 piece of paper and two of the main characters were called Adele and Marjorie. Mm -hmm. And all I had was just Adele's name on one post-it and Marjorie's on another. And the entirety (laughs) of the paper was blank, but I had a novel. That's excellent. (laughs) You know, everybody works differently. Um, And I do think there's a lot of trial and error in mine and like testing things out. The the problem comes when you might feel a bit stuck and you've written 50, 60,000 words, which aren't right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not, if I've got a flow going, to be honest with you, 50,000 I could do in two weeks. Like that's not so much problem. There's always probably too many words. And then Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to like a sculptor refine it scrape it away until I find, you know, what has to happen. And and some people are very good at plot and some people are very good at character and description or dialogue. And I think plot, I know things that I like to happen, but it mm-hmm. is sometimes hard to, to, to work out the beats. That's why you have a good editor. Well, I was about to say, <laughs> where does your editor come into this process? Yeah. Because you have a UK editor and a US editor. Yeah. So it's, yeah. how much is shifting between those two worlds for you? Um, this experience with the House of Fortune, um, my editor, uh, he's actually moved on now. I don't think it was because of my book, Made Him Lee <laughs> Publishing, I really hope. It was some just very delicate readjustments. Uh, mm-hmm. This one was very um, UK driven, I would say, mm-hmm. but with a few little adjustments. Certainly with my first novel, that was a much more collaborative, transatlantic mm-hmm. collaborative, right. you know, three-way conversation because we had a Canadian editor as well. Um, and that was harder because mm-hmm. there were more voices involved. Right. But actually, I do feel I'm a writer who who really relishes the conversations. Mm-hmm. I don't take a front if someone has a problem with something so often through a conversation with, with a sensitive, imaginative person. More often than not, you're going to get more good ideas and, and a sense of your own you know, island that you're standing on and your certainty grows with what you want to do. So I find it... Um, you know, a good editor obviously is worth their weight in gold and beyond. Everyone needs an editor. Even if you're, <laughs> even if you're just writing flap cut, everyone needs an editor. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up. I cannot go yeah. out into the world without an edit. Um, <laughs> can we talk about your literary influences for a second? I mean, you've yeah. been a published novelist for, well, eight years now, since 2014. Yeah. 
But you had been sort of noodling around and thinking about writing before then and, you know, sort of famously wrote the miniaturist on your phone as you were commuting to work. I love stories like that because I'm like, I walk to work, so there was no typing. So. <laughs> <laughs> if you get you one with a little ribbon. No, 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 like, no, no, no. I'm good. Really, no, no. I'm, okay. I, I'm, All right. We won't I'm, do so, that. I'm not going to be the person writing a novel on my phone. But I love those stories. I mean, uh, Chen Julie Wong also wrote um, a really fantastic memoir while she was working in a really? law firm in New York. Same thing, typing it out. And those stories are great. But who are the writers you keep going back to? Who are the people you want to reread or see more from? Or I mean, there's some I'll never see more from because they're dead, which is a shame. But I do. So the deceased, my deceased heroes, I would love to see more from Anita Bruckner, alas. My kind of like top heroes yeah um it, it, it i mean it, it's hillary mantel i mean mm -hmm. i just i love her range i think it was reading wolf hall where i realized what historical fiction can do and she's just so brave all the time mm -hmm. and funny she's got such a, a wit um siri husvet's writing i'm mm -hmm. i i love um, I recently read a book by um, an author called Barbara Trapedo called mm -hmm. Brother of the More Famous Jack, which someone recommended to me. <laughs> what a great title. Yeah, it's so extraordinary. The voice, again, and, ama and I think she she's still alive. She's about 81 or two, mm -hmm. I believe, um, living in the UK. Um, so that's somebody who I've just discovered. Uh, Emily St. John Mandel, I love her writing. Um, Jenny Offill. Mm -hmm. And who, you know, I, I get asked this and then I, I come across as the most illiterate writer because I can't remember who I've read. Um, Rachel Cusk recently. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tend to, I really love writers who are quite economical. I mean, Atwood growing up, definitely. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, she was one of the first sort of serious novelists I was introduced mm -hmm. to as a little, as a child, well, a young woman, a sort of yeah. 11, 12. And recently I turned 40 last week, actually, and my partner found a first edition from 1939 by Faber and Faber of a book called A Traveller in Time mm -hmm. by Alison Utley. Okay. And I haven't read that book since I was 11. And I, I was very moved because it's sort of after everything that's happened with my writing career mm -hmm. and, and basically being alive and growing up to go back to a book that was I found in the school library before social media was invented, before I became mm -hmm. a published writer. Oh God, it was quite a goosebump moment because I found I was meeting my younger self again. So that's a book rather than perhaps a writer who has been so, I know, having looked at it again now, like how many years, 29 years later, um, I realize is in my DNA. Meeting your younger self on the page or in a book is a really interesting idea. Is that why you write historical fiction? It's funny that I do, I do write what is deemed to be historical mm -hmm. fiction. And I think it is a, a, a conversation I'm having with my younger self who loved the idea of time travel, who yes. loved the idea that these people were perhaps not so different from us, who quite quickly could imagine mm -hmm. herself out of her body and into another world against all the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm not alone in that. I think so many people want to read for a moment in their day or week of escape, but mm -hmm. not mindless escape, but detailed, pleasurable, important escape. Right. So yes, I think there is some kind of, um, you know, connection I'm making with my younger self. And it's funny, like the more novels you write, I've actually written four novels for adults mm -hmm. now. Okay. And it's funny, the more you write, the more you're read, if you're lucky, and the mm -hmm. more people almost analyze you or analyze what you're doing or see mm -hmm. patterns and things that perhaps unconsciously you don't notice. Right. And I always remember Ali Smith being asked, how do you do what you do? <laughs> you know, the big oh, yeah. question. She's like, I hate this question because it's, if I have to describe it, I'll ruin the magic. Um, and that's the strangeness of being more public and being more read is that you have to hold on very much to your initial urge to write, mm -hmm. which is from a much more innocent place. You're not, you know, not, you're not performing yourself as a published writer. You must right. try and like be more private. What's next? Have you started working on the new book? I mean, N no, okay. no, I haven't because I'm, 
I had my baby son and I took the year off, um, mm -hmm. which was wonderful. Um, and he's bimbling around next door. I can hear, I can hear blocks <laughs> being smashed on the floor. He's not alone. He's not out there aged one. He is with his father. I have a, a children's book that I'm scheduled to write. And this is a children's novel, like a proper mm -hmm. novel, yep. a long novel. That is next on the slate. And then, um, we will see because I just sort of feel like a bit I mean God knows how I managed to write this book to be honest with you mm -hmm. through the pandemic and all the kind of vicissitudes of pregnancy but also my parents house burned down in the middle of oh, it and they sorry <laughs> yikes they're, they're all right said. yeah no I mean they're they're fine but it was just this odd mirroring again of a family trying yep. to find a new place to live and it was literally my family whilst I was writing my other family my my Nella mm -hmm. Brown family trying to find a place to live in the world because the baby came along just as the book was handed in normally one has a, a decompression period of just like what the mm. hell just happened i've pushed that book out well i pushed a different a different book out um and <laughs> i haven't had much time to sort of gather my wits mm -hmm. i've not i've been asked you know how 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 is it writing with now being a mum? and i'm like well i don't know because i haven't done it yet so before i let you go because we are bumping up on time and you do have a tiny person and you know all sorts of stuff that's going on but i don't want to leave without mentioning one piece of the book that we sort of stayed away from because mm -hmm. stuff is happening and but there's a lot about the theater in mm -hmm. amsterdam in the early 1700s Thea goes to the theater a lot, which I found a very pleasant surprise because I, I do honestly think of this period as like very dour kind of yeah, Calvinist fun. and yeah. like theater. But I mean, it's Shakespeare. There's a lot of the Greek classic. I mean, it's kind of extraordinary what you've been able to do to recreate this experience for Thea. And Nella doesn't really share Thea's love <laughs> of the theater no, in Nella, any way, shape or form. No, Nella's very suspicious of performance that she mm -hmm. thinks is, you know, deceitful mm -hmm. um even though obviously she's participating in a very different kind of public performance which mm -hmm. could arguably call, be called deceitful as well yeah i mean I, I used to be an actress and i think that this is a sort of love letter to the theater in some way you know it's not so much the public or the audience sitting there it's what's going on backstage it's mm -hmm. the actors it's the set painters it's the creation of false realities Mm -hmm. in order for us to actually work out our own stories and to feel comfortable with uncomfortable things, which I, I think art often is. Thea argues with her aunt and says, no, they're fabricators of truth. Mm -hmm. you know, she sees it as this really positive thing. But I think for me, and I think in all my novels, there is often a creative person or a, a, a novelist or a painter, often a painter, mm -hmm. because I'm not a painter myself. So I find it this like thing shrouded in awe and mystery um, that through lifelike scenarios that actually aren't you can emancipate yourself or liberate yourself or or envisage futures for yourself that you don't quite yet live but you mm -hmm. might one day at the same time i think this book does comment on the perils of that as well of imagination of having a too strong imagination it mm -hmm. can be as much of a prison you know your thoughts uh, or your visions as as much as um, it can be something that sets you free. And I think that there is that commentary going on in this novel um, about a balance between flights of fantasy and, you know, cynicism that, that has a dead end to it. Yeah, you put your characters through a lot in this book. I do. You put them through a lot. Fair enough. I mean, listen, it's a very entertaining read. The pages fly. I mean, I will say House of Fortune moves very, very fast and yeah. it's very fun. And yeah, you might, if you're like me, you might end up yelling at some folks on stage, <laughs> but I have no shame. I will totally own that. I have no, I am so not cool about that. I'm just like, there are times I can be yelling at anyone on the page. So Jesse Burton, thank you so much for joining us on Poured Over. House of Fortune is out now. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another TBR Top Off, where we recommend books for you to pick up when you come in for your copy of The House of Fortune. I'm Becky. And I'm Mark. <laughs> and we are coming to you from our home store in Cincinnati, Ohio. And if it's all right with you, I'm going to get started. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the book that I chose is The Distant Hours by Kate Morton. Mm -hmm. And I chose this book because I think it's very similar to House of Fortune in that they are both historical fiction. 
um, with these family secrets lurking in the background. Uh, so in this one, we follow Edie, and uh, she is 30. She's in the book publishing world, and uh, I'm a little jealous of that. But anyway, mm. she is uh, home visiting her parents for the weekend. And while she's there, her mother gets a letter that is postmarked almost 50 years ago. Obviously, Edie is very curious. And her mother, though, is very closed-lipped and really just doesn't want to share much. So, again, Edie just... That's sparking her curiosity even more. So she finds that the letter is from a place called Milderhurst Castle, which is not that far away. So while she's out driving, she decides to stop by. And there she meets the Blythe sisters. Um, she meets Safi and Percy, who are 85 years old, and they are twins. And they uh, have been staying at, the, at this castle really their whole lives. Um, and kind of keeping an eye on their younger sister, Juniper, who is in her early 70s and just hasn't been the same since the broken engagement and disappearance of her fiancé that happened about 50 years ago. Ooh. Also, about 50 years ago, we find out that Meredith, Edie's mother, stayed at Mil Milderhurst Castle when she was evacuated during the London Blitz. Of World War II. Lots of secrets uh, that are coming out and just lots of mysteries then that all unspool. It's a lot. You find out a lot more about the sisters. You, you find out a lot more about Meredith. And um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and when you think you know something, oh, no, no, it, it switches. And you were like, oh, I well, didn't see that one coming. So it's just it's a fun one. I definitely highly recommend it. It is The Distant Hours by Kate Morton. Mark, what do you have for us? Oh, nice choice. That sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I chose a book that's got a little bit of fantastical flavor, mm -hmm. um, similar to House of Fortune. Um, and it is The Binding by Bridget Collins. Ooh, this book. <laughs> it is, I feel like Taylor made for me. Um, it's right up my alley. It centers around uh, book magic. So yes, please, absolutely <laughs> sign me up. You follow a man, young man named Emmett whose skills at his family farm are not amazing. Uh, he's not a lazy fellow. He just has a wandering mind. He forgets a lot. Um, he just has his head in the clouds. So he's sent off to apprentice at a bookbinding shop um, in the hopes that he can kind of get his head on straight. Um, and maybe cure him of his dopiness. Oh. Yeah, poor guy. Um, but in this world, bookbinding has a very different uh, flavor and feel. Uh, bookbinding is meant to contain memories, um, things that people want forgotten, you know, trysts or um, shame. They, uh, somebody can pop into a bookbinder shop have that memory sealed up in a book and placed on a shelf never to be opened again. Pretty interesting uh, premise that I love very, very much. So Emmett is um, jumping right in. He's learning the trade. Um, and while he's doing this, his curiosity is growing more and more, particularly about a client who has come in who he just can't quite place. Mysteries <laughs> abound, magic abound. It is a yummy book uh, for bibliophiles. Um, I ate it right up and I think you will too. Uh, it's a, such a cool premise and it's told very deftly. Uh, so please, please check out The Binding by Bridget Collins. Oh, good pick. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness. Um, well, so that's all that we have for you today. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to Port Over. Um, please rate and subscribe when you have a chance so that you never miss an episode. I'm Becky. And I'm Mark. And you can follow us at our home store at BN Westchester. You can also follow Port Over at Barnes & Noble. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely pick up these books and um, happy reading. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Uh... Port Over is a Barnes & Noble production. The show is available on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.